Our uh, third presenter for this session is Dr. Stella Bialis. She is the as Associate Professor in the School of Nursing at the University of California at San Francisco. She's also the President of the International Society of Nurses in Cancer Care. She's a consultant of the WHO Tobacco-Free Initiative, and she's an internationally recognized expert on tobacco industry monitoring and developing policies to address tobacco industry interference with public health. Thank you, and thank you so much for the invitation for being here. Um, I get very passionate, and I get very excited when there is a cancer meeting and tobacco is included. I shouldn't because it should be obvious, but in, sometimes it isn't. So I get excited anyway. I tend to be excitable. Um, this is a little reminder. Mike um, showed us a very similar uh, slide. Uh, and sort of it's, uh, is this the point? Of, yeah. So this is like a good news, bad news part. So you see a little decrease from um, 2007 to 2013, and that's uh, adult prevalence. And you see it, that is pretty much uh, everywhere. The one thing I want to highlight is here, very low prevalence of use, tobacco use among women. This is the epidemic that does not have to happen. So I hope 20 years from now we are not talking about the increase in prevalence among women because this is where we can really and should do something about all tobacco-related cancers and other, other tobacco-related diseases. Very concerning to me is that we have had now data, thanks to the CDC and WHO, on the Global, Global Youth um, Tobacco Use Survey, GYTS, and in many, many countries, particularly low- and middle-income countries, we see more girls, 13 to 15, smoking at the rates that are higher or equal than boys. And we keep talking about the emerging issue of smoking among women. I'm sorry. If something is emerging for 20 years, it's not emerging, it's neglected. So this is our opportunity, and either we're going to continue to make a big investment to keep it at this level, or are we going to really, really miss the boat? Okay, off the soapbox for a second. <laughs> this is what we are fighting against. So even though we do see decrease in prevalence, because of population growth, there is still a very high number of people who use tobacco. So the decrease in prevalence, unfortunately, does not tell us the whole story. And as you were saying right before me, the tobacco industry remains an incredibly profitable business. Uh, this is at about $850 billion a year. So it's a lot of money uh, compared to the monies that we saw uh, Michael share with us uh, that is invested. All we need is 11 cents a person. It's way lo a lot less than the $850 billion. And we are not getting to that level, not even close. You mentioned uh, Article 5.3. So Article 5.3 is an actual paragraph in this United Nations Treaty. And this is what the paragraph says. In setting and implementing their public health policies with respect to tobacco control, parties shall act to protect this policy from commercial and other vested interests of the tobacco industry in accordance with national law. Now, 180 countries agree to do this. 180 countries agree to take measures to stop the tobacco industry from trying to do what they tried to do in the Philippines and to try to do things that they're still doing in many parts of the country. It's not me who is saying this. This is also unique because it's the only UN treaty, United Nations treaty, that actually singles out an industry as a major barrier to achieving the goals of the treaty. So that is very significant. This is very broadly what the uh, article guidelines says. So each article, several articles of the convention has guidelines to assist implementation. And you can find uh, the details online. But the principal one is what I want to just remind. There is a fundamental, fundamental and irreconcilable conflict of interest between tobacco industry and public health. Full stop. So all these partnerships, all these great efforts, all these campaigns to support health impact, there are countries in which the industry are supporting immunization campaigns. No, don't do that because you, you get, it gives you in your hand, it takes with the other. So you really need to balance 
you know, do look at this gift horse in the mouth because there's something in there. And there is a treaty that if we're one of the 180 countries part of this treaty, that is a big no-no. It's not that simple. It's a lot easier said than no. So these are the latest update on what the countries that are parties of the convention are saying, that they implemented measures to stop the industry interference. Um, so about 57% of the countries that responded to that question says yes, they have done something about it. We see a bit of an increase on the yes uh, number of answers. Unfortunately, that does not tell us the whole story. Because when you get to the details, what it is that you are doing to stop industry interference, we get a very big mixed bag of answers. Enforcement training on uh, enforcement of smoke-free laws. We banned sponsorship. That one is actually a good one. We had a press conference on World No Tobacco Day. That is not compliance with counter-industry interference. We passed some sort of legislation on tobacco-related. Well, it may or may not be. We had a workshop. Again, these are not compliance measures. Some do mention code of ethics. These are compliance measures. So again, it's clearly that countries need a lot of help still to find out what it is that we need to do to stop tobacco industry interference. And there are groups like SIATCA that you as a part that is really helping develop tools and resources, breaking down in small steps what you can do as a country. So again, the tobacco industry, meanwhile, is happily taking their cash to the bank. Uh, this is a few good examples that we have. This is a resource that the WHO put together to help countries implement some of these measures. So there's many, many examples of excellent code of conducts for civil service, many good examples throughout the world. Uh, and these are, of course, mostly deal with conflict of interest, public and private interest, accepting gifts. Um, there is really comprehensive new legislation, as if a couple of months ago or less, in Moldova and Uganda. Uh, the world is waiting to see how they're going to implement that, but it's very strict in terms of banning industry access to political leaders and to civil service. Uh, and creating all kinds of rules on what can and cannot be discussed with the industry when and how. Um, Mauritius have banned corporate social responsibility. So what Mike was saying about all these gifts, all this sponsorship of the arts is no longer possible uh, in Mauritius. They just, it is considered marketing by the framework convention. So if you ban marketing, you ban these activities. So there are many, many good examples, uh, uh, but we need a lot more examples. We cannot have only half of the countries doing something uh, because we need all of them to do something. Then we bring it back to the role of health professionals. I really love it that uh, we just saw the images of the doctors supporting the tax increase in the Philippines. It's very important. Health professionals are opinion leaders. There is a whole publication by WHO on how health professionals need to be more involved. We need to get cancer societies a lot more involved in policy, a lot more involved in tobacco control, a lot more involved in advocating for things such as taxation and price increases that can then generate funds for all other wonderful cancer control measures we need. So we just need a lot more of that involvement and we haven't quite seen the level of involvement that we should see. Um, a few years ago, we did a survey of how many cancer, professional cancer societies, oncology nursing association, oncology medical associations, had policies on tobacco control, opposition statements on tobacco control, almost none. How many of these groups have policies saying that they will not accept funding from the tobacco industry? We found two, globally. Two, had a state explicit. We talked to some and some said, oh, obvious, we're not gonna take money. For, well, it's not obvious if it's not in writing. It's not obvious if it's not in writing. So again, we need to do a lot more on that. And then we need to do a lot more on cessation. And I think we didn't talk about that yet. Cessation 
In the empower that Michael shows, the O offer assist to cessation. Some people say O stands for orphan. Is the sort of like, oh yeah, and let's do cessation. There is a fear of cessation. Oh, it's too expensive to do cessation. Oh, nobody knows what to do. Well, well that's all kind of true. There is very, very few evidence-based life-saving interventions out there in the world for over 30 years waiting to be implemented. Cessation is one of them. It's evidence-based, it saves lives, it is cost-effective, we have to provide it to those who are already sick, particularly those with cancer, and we have more and more and more research coming out about the benefits of cessation on survival rates for cancer. We have to integrate it with screening. We talked so much about cervical cancer this morning. We gotta integrate it some, at least asking the women who are camp coming for your cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, do you smoke? If you wanna help, I can help you. Brief intervention. And we are not doing that. We can't treat it as an isolated thing. A lot of physicians and nurses have fear of talking about smoking with their cancer patients or their patients in the hospital. Oh, they're so stressed about cancer. I'm not going to talk about quitting smoking. And I'm thinking, well, if you find out they have hypertension, you're going to hand them a bag of chips? No, you're going to say you shouldn't be having a bag of chips. You find high blood levels. I mean, we go on and on and on about our cancer patients who are taking drugs that can change their glucose level, and you talk about that. We talk about diet control, and we can't talk about cessation when, in some cases, may increase your life by nine months. Very few drugs out there increase your survival rate by nine months. Very few. So again, it's a myth and misconceptions that we as health professionals still have. So again, this is just to show the impact. So if you do everything, we can reduce the number of expected deaths. If we add cessation to the mix, we can reduce that number by a whole lot more, as in over 100 million lives saved, just by adding cessation to the mix. So we can't continue to be afraid of incorporating cessation as just everyday evidence-based practice. That's it. It's not a choice, not when you have time, not when you have a chance. Those of you who have practiced for a little longer, uh, like myself, may remember that when the pain control scale came out, you know, the little faces, the sad face, the happy face, a lot of us, nurses including, we don't have time to be doing this. Oh my goodness, and now we're gonna have to do pain control scale. Well. People graduating school these days don't even think about not asking on a scale one to ten how is a pain level. So it's the same thing. Practices do change. We do incorporate things in our routine care regardless of how busy we are. And it's overdue time that we incorporate at least brief advice. Again, uh, these are some minimum things. There is actually an article in the Framework Convention about cessation, Article 14. We need to educate health professionals, we need to incorporate, uh, we need to have quit lines, and we do need to have drugs, but you know, keep in mind, drugs is not gonna be the main thing. And we have many examples in many countries where actually there has been very good levels of cessation with very little amount of drugs dispensed. Of course, if they are free and they are available and they're properly used, it improves a lot your cessation rates, but there are Many, many people that are managed to quit so far with intervention, with repeated intervention and support, and particularly uh, quit lines and health professional advice. So again, policy involvement might not be everybody's cup of tea. A lot of health professionals don't like to do policy, but brief tobacco cessation intervention must be every health professional cup of tea. There's not a choice there. I love my soapbox, I guess. Huh? I keep saying I'm going to step out and I get right back on. Um, this is just a paper that we did because I think with the NCD's agenda and the inclusion of tobacco control, we have a lot of opportunities to incorporate tobacco control in a horizontal fashion. We did this for nurses, but I think it's applicable to other health professionals. TB clinics, HIV clinics, primary health clinics, MCH clinics, there's all levels of care that you can incorporate it a little bit. Ask about smoke-free homes, 
ask about tobacco use, refer to a quit line, provide a brief advice. I mean, these can be incorporated throughout within the NCDs, and so it's a big opportunity. And of course, I can't, uh, and I'm happy many people mention nursing. There are 19 million nurses and midwives out there, so it's quite a bit force to be uh, mobilized. So uh, my colleague Linda Sarna from UCLA and I, we have been doing a lot of work in educating nurses on incorporating brief interventions. Uh, these are some of the countries we have been working with, uh, and we're experimenting with in-person and online training. And so this is just a recent example that we did with nurses in Beijing and Hefe, uh, and we did an online, 40-minute online intervention, educational intervention, did a pre and post, and six months after they received the, they watched the video, not very long, and all you were asking them to do is that, ask your patient, this is important, talk to them about it, refer to a quit line or to a cessation clinic. And we had incredibly good results, if I say so myself. Recommending smoke-free home was incredibly successful. Nurses felt very comfortable doing that. Uh, to their patients, uh, China is a country where women don't smoke at very high rates, but men do. So women are exposed to secondhand smoke in children at home in tremendous rates. And so again, uh, the thing with China is that a very, very small percentage change in China is a huge change in numbers with 300 million smokers. If we get 10% of them to quit, that's 30 million ex-smokers. That's a lot of people who quit smoking. So again, we need to continue to mobilize. And I emphasize mobilizing nurses because the physician smoking rate in China is still very high. And a lot of them are very reluctant. And Michael here does a lot of work with physicians in China. A lot of them are reluctant to talk to patients about that. Uh, I personally don't think it's an issue. I don't think we have to have or not have a disease to talk to a patient. I think you do your professional duty regardless, right? I mean, we had politicians who smoke and still support smoke-free environments. We have, I don't have to have had cancer to talk to a woman about cancer. Um, and so I think it's a bit of an excuse, but we need to address that. Oops. So I think our glass is about half full, and I think there's many opportunities for us to continue to fill this glass. I think the issue of funding was already discussed here this morning and is a challenge, but I think we have to continue to mobilize about that. Uh, I think we do need to continue to monitor the tobacco industry and develop measures, and we need to help countries find these measures and implement these measures. Uh, support for the legal challenges is important, but there are other things we can do through civil service, for example. Uh, there's too many proven strategies. I think we talked about that this morning already. It's the same story. We know what to do. We just got to go do it. And again, mobilize some health professionals, including oncology settings, to get more engaged at a minimum in implementing brief smoking cessation as routine uh, Care is routine care is best practices. I think we need to develop strategies to maximize the plantation. I think tobacco is included in the NCDs. The tobacco industry is highlighted in the political decision from the UN high level meeting. I think the sustainable development goals, which were just approved about a month or two ago, both talk about the NCDs and the framework convention. So these are great opportunities for us to galvanize, not just to implement programs, but to gather resources and make some of these linkages for going horizontal, not being specialized, not looking at cancer prevention as a cancer specialty care, but looking at primary care, like was said before, and looking at tobacco cessation and tobacco control. How many primary clinics are smoke-free? We haven't even talked about that yet. Every single primary health clinic in the world should be smoke-free. And they're not. Trust me, they are not. Not every hospital in the world is smoke-free. Not every hospital in the United States is smoke-free, believe it or not. So, I mean, these are like very small steps, but we need to start galvanizing around some of these small steps and mobilizing as health professionals and as health professional organizations to get there and take advantage of some of these doors that are opening because if we don't jump on these doors, we're going to miss out. Thank you very much.